The market is sufficiently accurate in reflecting information that it's incredibly hard to beat and therefore you're much better off simply buying and holding an index fund which holds all the stocks in the market than trying to do active management. On Wealth Track, Professor Burt Malkiel and why his investment classic, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, has stood the test of time. Funding provided by Clearbridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. In this complex, ever-changing world, is it possible that there are essential investment truths that can make successful investing simple and accessible to the average person? Yes, says this week's guest, and he has 50 years of research to prove it. He is Burton Malkiel, the author of the investment classic, A Random Walk Down Wall Street, The Best Investment Guide That Money Can Buy. The 13th edition of A Random Walk was just published to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Malkiel is a legendary financial thought leader, PhD economist, professor of economics emeritus at Princeton, where he chaired its economics department, former dean of the Yale Law School of Management, former 25-year board member of Vanguard, former member of the board of the American Stock Exchange, and now investment committee member of Rebalance IRA, which combines automatic rebalancing with a financial advisor consultation. He is author of nearly 20 books and hundreds of scholarly articles and opinion pieces. Balkio believes even more strongly today in his original thesis, writing in his introduction to the latest random walk, investors would be far better off buying and holding a broad-based index fund than attempting to buy and sell individual securities or actively manage mutual funds. And Malkiel writes, there's a seven-figure gain to prove it. An investor with $10,000 to invest at the start of 1977, when the first index fund became available, would have a portfolio worth $2.1 million at the start of 2022, assuming all dividends were reinvested. A second investor who instead purchased shares in the average actively managed mutual fund would have seen the investment grow to $1.5 million. The index investor was ahead by $666,000 or a staggering two-thirds of a million dollars. So that's the track record if we had invested for the last 47 years. But what about now? With all of the changes that have occurred in the markets and the vast array of products and strategies available to investors, why is investing still a random walk? Well, in a way, uh, because of all the new things that have happened, because of all the uh, new professional investors uh, who are, in fact, with computers that are as close uh, to the market maker as they possibly can, in some sense, it means that the market is almost more efficient than it was. If you think back 50 years ago, uh, where individual investors were the main investors in the market, where in fact you had runners who were uh, putting orders in uh, and uh, the telephone would go to the runner and the runner would go to the post on the New York Stock Exchange, in some sense, information was getting reflected uh, more slowly uh, uh -huh. than it is today. So in some sense, the fact that uh, the market efficiency uh, is now uh, more professional, professionals are most of the trading, it would suggest that the market is even more of a random walk in the sense that the information is reflected right away and it changes when there's new information but new information is really random. I mean, if, if I say that uh, uh, retailers are stocking up with, with spring uh, inventory, that's not news. Uh, but if in fact uh, uh, the Russians said, I give up, uh, we're going to stop uh, fighting the Ukrainians, that would be news. But true news is random, i.e. unpredictable. And what we mean by a random walk market, it's a market where information's already reflected. It'll change with new news, but new news 
is unpredictable and so are market prices. Let me ask you about the uh, efficient market hypothesis because you write in your book that it is often misinterpreted by the press and I probably sit here guilty as charged. What is the efficient market hypothesis uh, in its you know, purest form and what is misunderstood about it? What it means simply is that when there's information about the economy, about individual companies, that that information gets reflected in prices without delay. So that if a drug company has got a new cure for cancer and it's supposed to be worth now instead of $20 a share, $40 a share, it goes to 40 right away because if it went up slowly, it would just create opportunities for investors. Now, what it doesn't mean is that everybody's always rational, they're not, mm -hmm. or that prices are always right. How could they be? Prices are supposed to be the present value of all future earnings, and future earnings can only be estimated. So in some sense, prices are always wrong. What EMH, or efficient market hypothesis, says is right. nobody can be sure whether they're too high or too low. Yes, there are bubbles, but nobody knows uh, when they occur, how long they're going to go, when they're going to pop, uh, and therefore that the tableau of market prices in the market today is really pretty unbeatable. I mean, think of it this way. The market is sufficiently accurate in reflecting information that it's incredibly hard to beat and therefore you're much better off simply buying and holding an index fund which holds all the stocks in the market than trying to do active management. And Bert, one of the things that you wrote uh, in your book, which I thought was so interesting about the efficient market hypothesis, is that there are no possibilities for earning extraordinary gains without taking on extraordinary risks. That's absolutely right. Uh, the way uh, we academics uh, often say, uh, the efficient market professors are walking along with his graduate students. One of the graduate students sees a $100 bill on the ground and the professor says, uh, don't bother to stoop to pick it up. If it were really a $100 bill, it wouldn't be there. Well, I'm not quite that extreme. I say, pick it up right away because there are too many smart people around and it sure isn't going to be there for long. And so, uh, uh, yep, there are some opportunities from time to time, uh, but not without taking a great deal of risk. We saw, for example, recently in the meme stock craze where GameStop uh, was doubling and then doubling again, and one of the uh, hedge funds, Melvin Capital, said, this is crazy, I'm gonna sell the, sh uh, sell the stock short, and of course the hedge fund went bankrupt trying to do it. So it's not that uh, there aren't mistakes, uh, and sometimes you'll be right in trying to correct the mistakes, but you can't do it without risk, and there are no riskless arbitrage opportunities available in the market. You know, one question I know that you get all of the time uh, in questioning the efficient market hypothesis is, well, gee, if the market's so efficient, you know, why are there, you know, market bubbles and why are there market busts? And your response to that is what? Look, there's no question that not all people are rational and sometimes you get stories that just get uh, transmitted over the internet or uh, over the local bar uh, and uh, people will go crazy. But here's the problem with it. Let's take the internet bubble uh, that popped in early 2000. Uh, Alan Greenspan uh, was the head of the Federal Reserve at the time and you might say, well, he knew it was there uh, he was the one that coined the expression irrational exuberance. So, sure, people knew. So, why couldn't you have made a lot of money? Well, what people forget is that Alan Greenspan made that statement in 1996, not in March of 2000 when the bubble popped. 
And in fact, if you had bought in 1996, when he coined the expression irrational exuberance, you would have done quite well. Again, it's not that the prices are always right. The prices can be terribly wrong, but you never know. And anybody who tries to time the market, sure, once in a while, someone's gonna get it right. But if you try to do it, you're much more likely to make terrible mistakes. And what people then do is, and we know this from the data so clearly, that people tend to buy in the market when everyone is over optimistic. They sell just when the world is falling apart, like 2008 during the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just the wrong thing to do. I want you to just buy and hold put money in regularly, save regularly, be disciplined. Yup, the market will go crazy from time to time, but ignore it over the long pull. This is the way you build an effective retirement portfolio. You have invested yourself in individual securities. Um, so what place does active investing have, do you think, for the average person? I mean, you're, you're really a pro in investing. So look, uh, nobody who has studied the stock market all of his life uh, isn't interested in trying to play the game, and I do buy some individual securities. But I'm able to do it because my 401k, it's actually, uh, mine goes through a university, it's a 403b, but it's the same sort of thing, right. is entirely invested in index funds. And I've always said, if you've got the core of your portfolio invested in index funds, you've got your retirement portfolio set up properly, then you wanna buy some individual stocks, by all means, go and do it. Uh, but do it only as an add-on to a retirement portfolio that's set up in individual index funds. Go back more than 50 years. How did you happen to write a random walk down Wall Street where did you come up with the thesis? It was before the first you know, index mutual fund had even uh, been introduced by Jack Bogle. Yep, that's absolutely right. And uh, came up with the idea. I started my career on Wall Street with one of the leading firms. Uh, I was uh, an investment banker. I spent a lot of time with the research department and I noticed that the research departments would come up with recommendations, the price would go up right away because it was a big firm, but then they'd fall back to exactly where they were before. And I saw people doing active management, and I looked at what the record was, and then I looked at what was the record of the Standard & Poor's 500, what was the record of the broad-based indices, and I thought to myself, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong. They're not outperforming. And as a skeptical person, I decided that, wait a minute, maybe the emperor doesn't have any clothes. And when I then became an academic and actually did this kind of research myself, I found that, you know, that's right. In fact, the average index fund does better than the average actively managed fund. The book, the first edition of the book was reviewed by some Wall Street people who said, this is naive. Uh, who wants guaranteed mediocrity? Three years later, when Jack Bogle introduced the first index fund, he was going to do an, in an initial public offering of 250 million. He could only sell $11 million worth of the first index fund and it was very slow to catch on. It was called Bogle's Folly. So uh, yes, Wall Street was very skeptical, but what we know now is, and we see this with Standard & Poor's reports uh, each uh, year, that consistently one-third of active managers get beaten by the index, and the one-third who win in one year aren't the same who win in the next year, so that when you compound it over 10, 20 years, 90% of actively managed funds are beaten by a broad-based index fund. I'm not saying it's impossible to outperform, but if you try to do it, you're much more likely to be in the 90% of the distribution. Don't do it. Have that safe 
index fund as the core of your portfolio and you'll do very well in saving for retirement. So 50 years in, uh, you, you told me that some things are completely the same, some things are completely different. So the completely the same is that thesis, right? That indexing, buying the broader market is going to outperform over time. And I feel even more strongly about it than I did 50 years ago. But 50 years in, what's completely different? What's completely changed? Well, there are lots more opportunities for people to shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, one thing that's changed is uh, we've had what I would call a bubble in cryptocurrencies. We had Bitcoin uh, move from uh, uh, practically nothing to almost $70,000 and then recently down to 15. This is not what you want in your portfolio. Uh, there are a lot of new inventions uh, that supposedly are uh, uh, better ways to invest. Be very, very careful of these. Be right. very, very careful of the people who are trying to sell them to you. And let me ask you about some of them. For instance, you told me that you consider ESG investing to be dangerous. Environmental, social, governance standards for investing to be dangerous. What's dangerous about ESG? What's dangerous about uh, ESG is number one, it's not very clear that when you buy an ESG fund, you are in fact buying pure companies. Uh, take a public utility that's bad because it burns coal, but the same public utility is one of the few that has promised to be carbon free by a date certain and invests more in wind and solar power than anything else. So is it good or is it bad? Is natural gas bad because it's carbon or is it good because in the road to carbon neutrality, we want the cleanest burning carbon possible? So when you look at the ESG funds, it's not clear at all whether the companies are good or bad, and the people who are rating them are all over the map in terms of uh, whether they think they're uh, uh, good or bad. And number two, the idea that you think you're going to do well financially by doing it is, isn't true. Mm -hmm. The broad ESG funds are expensive funds, uh, and they underperform broad-based index funds. Look. I want you to feel good about your investing. Uh, I think it's wonderful if you want to buy a solar panel company, but do it as an add-on. Make your basic portfolio a broad-based index fund. You've also been critical of uh, factor investing, correct? Correct. Uh, there is uh, a so that, lot that's of- So that's like investing in value or investing in momentum or investing in, uh, you know, there are all sorts of different factors, low price earnings multiples that institutions are selling us as another way uh, to add alpha, to add extra it's, performance. And, and basically I call it another way to get more investment fees. Some of these factors work very well at some time. Some people say value investing is the thing to do. Well, it did very well in 2022, but it did terribly for the five years before that. Look, it's just when you buy an index fund, you're getting value, you're getting growth, you're getting small cap, you're getting momentum. This is still, the evidence is so clear that it's the right way to invest. Uh, what other asset classes work with indexing? The asset classes that work well are uh, common stocks, both mm -hmm. in the United States uh, and in Europe uh, and in Japan uh, and in emerging markets. And I believe that indexing, even though those markets aren't as efficient as the U.S. market, in part right. because of their inefficiency, there are stamp taxes when you try to sell, there are bid-ass spreads. In part because of their inefficiency, the evidence is clear that index funds outperform then as well. And it works in the bond market. Uh, where I wouldn't go and do it, uh, as a, is one of the very popular index funds now, 
we'll do an index of all the cryptocurrencies uh, that uh, now exist. I think those are the road to disaster. Uh, do this with standard uh, asset classes uh, like stocks and bonds, and let me add uh, real estate. Uh, mm -hmm. Real estate uh, index funds outperform actively managed real estate funds, and particularly in an inflationary environment, I want you to have some real estate in your portfolio, and incidentally, if you're going to be in the bond market, I want you to have some inflation-adjusted bonds. We've still got a lot of inflationary pressure in the market, and I want you to have some inflation protection. Right, and so for instance, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, the TIPS, uh, would be one that you can buy directly from the government. And the ones you buy directly from the government, which I very much approve of, are so-called I-bonds. Uh, right. You can buy 10,000. Uh, if you're married, you and your spouse can each buy 10,000. If you get a uh, tax refund, you can get an extra 5,000. Uh, this is guaranteed by the government uh, and is an absolutely wonderful inflation protection investment for individual investors. If, if there's one investment, Bert, that we should all own in a long-term diversified portfolio, I, I don't think you're going to surprise me, but, but what would it be? Well, I think you start off with a U.S. total stock market index fund, either uh, get it uh, from one of the mutual fund companies or mm -hmm. buy it as an exchange-traded fund. And the one thing I would say is the following. Be careful about your fees. Mm -hmm. You can now get these funds for two or three basis points. A basis point is one one hundredth of one percent. Make sure that it's low cost because one of the expressions of Jack Bogle that is my uh, favorite, and it's something investors have to keep in mind, the lower the fee you pay to the purveyor of the investment product, the more there will be for me, or as Jack used to put it, you get what you don't pay for. And you said a U.S. index fund. What about like the total global markets? I would start off with the U.S., but then as your portfolio developed, I would definitely diversify and include uh, uh, emerging market uh, funds, uh, European funds. I do think that international diversification uh, should definitely be part of your portfolio. But look, keep it simple at the very beginning. Uh, you're going to do this with one fund. I'd do it with a U.S. fund. Okay. What's the biggest surprise 50 years later of a random walk down Wall Street, what uh, impact it has had, or what, what surprised you the most? Well, what surprised me the most uh, was, given the bad reception that this idea of indexing uh, got, given the bad reception to uh, the first index fund, and the fact in the first decade uh, there's very little money invested in it, the fact that now more than half of mutual fund assets are in index funds, and if you then add the exchange-traded funds, you find uh, that people are complaining now that there's too much indexing. The fact uh, that now it's the majority uh, of the funds that people have to invest in, I would not have predicted that 50 years ago, uh, given the reception uh, that my book got, <laughs> given the reception that Jack Bogle got at Vanguard, and I am just uh, delighted to see it, uh, and I'm delighted to see that the flows that are coming in are way over 50% uh, into index funds because people finally have gotten the message, and it's the right message. Bert Malkiel, thank you so much for joining us on Wealth Track, and congratulations again on the 50th anniversary of an incredibly successful book. Who knew? <laughs> A random walk down Wall Street. Thanks, Bert. Thanks, Consuelo. I've appreciated talking with you. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. 
This week's action point should not be a surprise given the conversation you just heard with Professor Malkiel. It is read the 50th anniversary edition of a random walk down Wall Street, the best investment guide that money can buy. Like many of you, I already have at least one of the previous 12 editions of this investment classic. Truth be told, it was required reading when I first entered Wall Street not too soon after it was published in 1973. It was revolutionary then and still is considered to be an inconvenient truth in many professional investment circles. But the updates and analysis in the 50th anniversary edition, as well as the timeless investment advice, are priceless. This is an investment that will continue to pay dividends for many years to come. In this week's exclusive extra feature, Malkiel explains why a random walk succeeded despite a terrible reception from Wall Street and the financial press. Well, next week, Richard Clarida, former vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, discusses the radical transformation of Fed policy, which he heavily influenced, what it means for the economy and markets. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Enjoy your weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one. Thank you.